So we have um, our next talk is cool. from Ivan Aransky. Um, Ivan is currently um, a clinical assistant professor of medicine at the New York University School of Medicine. I hope I've, I've gotten that right. Um, but you probably know him better as being an award-winning um, scientific communicator and the co-founder of Retraction Watch. Um, Retraction's clearly one of the things that all of us, researchers, publishers, um, institutions, funders, trying to avoid um, through peer review. I think that we might be able to get a quick hello from Ivan before we start to play his recording, and then afterwards we may be able to take some, ses some questions. So, Ivan, are you there? Uh, I'm here. I, I don't know if I'm actually there with you. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, and we're going to move on to playing the video of, of what you're going to say, and then we'll come back to you if that's all right. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Ivan Moransky. I'm the co-founder of Retraction Watch. And I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in London today, but I know you're having a terrific conference and uh, glad to be able to share some thoughts with you and then take some questions uh, live. So this is obviously recorded uh, and, and all that. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a tour of scientific publishing today, obviously talking about peer review in particular. And I have some slides, which I know will be shown uh, while this video is being shown, and I'm going to sort of flip back and forth just so that I can remember what's on the slides and talk to you about what's there uh, as, I, as I talk today. So consider this a really a tour of the scientific, of scientific publishing's wild west. So my, on my first slide here, um, sort of asked a question about this particular paper and whether or not this is publishing today. So. Here we have uh, the Journal of Computer Science and Information Technology. Uh, looks like a legitimate journal, if not a particularly attractive looking journal, but that's okay. It has an ISSN number. Uh, the paper has a digital object identifier, DOI, all the trappings of a paper. But I want on the next slide to uh, just show you a little bit of why I am pointing this out to you here. And that's the, the title and the author list of this paper. So as you can see, uh, the title Maybe that's something that would raise red flags for some people. Maybe it would look normal for other people. But the author list is what is amusing here. And that's, of course, uh, Dr. I.P. Freely, uh, Dr. Oliver Klozoff, and their very famous uh, French colleague, Jacques Strap. Now, you may be hopefully chuckling uh, while, uh, while you're watching this, but these are all Simpsons characters. They're not actually authors of a scientific paper. So you might ask, how did these August Simpsons characters end up with a paper. Well, the way they did is that there's a program called SciGen, S-C-I-G-E-N. You can Google that. And if you Google that in MIT, it'll get you there. This was a couple of MIT grad students who, about a little more than a decade ago, created a program where they could come up with fake papers that, were, that looked a lot like real papers. And they were trying to sort of replicate or, if you will, industrialize something that uh, Alan Sokol had done uh, 20 years ago by creating a fake paper that he got published in a journal. He actually wrote a whole book about it. That episode became known as the Sokol Hoax. But this is a predatory journal. This is a journal that doesn't actually do any peer review. It claims to do peer review. It'll take your money and then publish your paper. But it's obviously not doing any peer review because if it was, you wouldn't have an authorship list like that. You probably wouldn't have a title like that either. So this is just speaking to the publisher parish phenomenon, the real fear that, that researchers have and what drives a lot of what we're seeing in terms of, I would argue, pro problematic peer review. So on the next slide, this is a little bit more of a serious story that involves uh, peer review and some of the problems we see there. Uh, the peer review scam, this is a, a piece that Adam Marcus, my co-founder of Traction Watch, uh, and Kat Ferguson, who was our first staff writer there. Uh, published in Nature about two years ago. It's not a peer-reviewed piece, but a piece of journalism. And I'll tell you the beginning of this piece. There's a researcher named Hyungin Moon, and Hyungin Moon's a plant researcher. He wanted to get a lot of papers published in order to get tenure and, and promotion and all of that that he would normally need to get. He wanted to make sure he got those papers published, so he picked a particular publisher that he knew would ask him for suggested peer reviewers, you know, which is not unusual. 
And he would, you know, suggest the peer reviewers, and the editor would say, oh, yes, Dr. Smith, I saw her, you know, give a presentation at the last com conference we went to. She's very smart, really knows her stuff. Clearly, she's a good peer reviewer for this. Press invite and ask Dr. Smith to do the peer review. But instead of, you know, joan.smith at nyu.edu, which would be Dr. Smith's normal email address, it was jsmith123 at gmail.com. And the person who got the jsmith123 at gmail.com was Young and Moo, actually, because he had created that email address. So he managed to peer review 28 of his own papers, which of course are retractive, which is why I know about it and why you're hearing about it today. Um, I should say the peer reviewers he did were very, very good. And, and I don't just mean that they were positive that this paper should be published, but actually they were high quality reviews, the kinds of reviews editors really like. You know, oh, you should really look at these axes, maybe fix this one. Um, your conclusion doesn't quite follow. You might want to think about this. I mean, very detailed, substantive reviews. Uh, of course, what nailed him, though, the reason why you're hearing about him from me, is that all of his reviews came back within 24 hours of being invited. And those of you who work at journals, and I know many of you have worked either as editors or working at journals, you can't even get people to agree to review a paper within 24 hours, let alone do the actual review. So this raised a lot of red flags. He ended up having to attract the papers once he was confronted, and he admitted what he'd actually done. But again, this speaks to the publisher parish problem, which feeds into some of the peer review problems that we, were seeing, that we are seeing. There are actually now more than 300 papers, uh, that number keeps climbing, retracted for fake peer review or some sort of falsified peer review. That's, of course, a problem. Um, on the next slide, I just want to put in context some of what's happening in terms of uh, retraction. So what this shows is the retractions are clearly on the rise. And so there were about 40 retractions in 2000 uh, and about 400 retractions in the year 2010. And Nature did a very good job of showing that, that growth, which, by the way, outpaced the growth in the number of papers published during that time. So the, that went about 44%. So you've had a 20-fold more increase than you would expect just by a one-to-one -one sort of linear relationship. That's continued to rise. Um, and that's what those bars are. The number's up to about 700 retractions in 2015 from PubMed. Um, and so often people ask, well, why is this happening? Uh, you know, is there more fraud? Uh, are people just better at catching all of these problems in the literature? And that's a very good question that a paper uh, on the next slide uh, actually tried to answer. And so what this paper did was look at all the reasons for retraction and found that about two-thirds of the time Retractions were done. This was in PNAS uh, about four years ago now. Um, and by the way, if you're interested in these issues, Farrakh Fang and Arturo Casadevall do a tremendous amount of really good work in this area. Grant Steen does too. He does a little bit less now. He's moved on to some other things. But this found that two-thirds of retractions were to falsification, fabrication, or plagiarism, the definition, the U.S. federal definition, which many other countries follow, of misconduct. Um, and they were able to do that by looking not just at the retraction notices, because according to them, less than half of the uh, retractions were due to misconduct, but actually looking at Retraction Watch postings. We had been around for a couple of years, looking at other media and their coverage of these issues. So there's actually, uh, because of a lot of the work that, that we and a lot of other people have been doing, we have a much better understanding. But this only argues, this only proves that we can actually catch things more. It doesn't show that there's actually more fraud and misconduct happening. However, a paper that Farrick and Arturo did um, along with uh, Elizabeth Bick, who really did most of the work, actually, in the paper in terms of the groundwork. Ellie's actually went through 20,000 papers and found 4% image manipulation, about 2% inappropriate image manipulation. And she found that that had grown since the beginning of this century, since 2000. So in other words, the rate of at least one kind of misconduct, of, of fraud, was actually higher and has been growing. So there is some suge suggestion, some evidence, that maybe uh, fraud is on the increase, that misconduct is on the increase. Again, that's preliminary evidence, but it's clear that we are better at finding these things, partly because papers are all online and many more people can look at them, partly because of plagiarism detection software and other uh, sort of tools like that. So on the next slide, just to show you sort of some of the people who retract the most papers, this is a sort of impressive list, although not impressive in a particularly good way, um, we like our leaderboards. It's like ESPN or some sports you know, network uh, at Retraction Watch. And so we have 183 retractions from the top 
retraction get at Yoshitaka Fuji. I'm going to tell you about his story at the end of the talk, just so hold your, hold your horses on that. Um, but number two is also uh, actually an anesthesiologist. They're both anesthesiologists. So um, hopefully, I would argue that means you should have more trust in anesthesiology because people are actually paying attention. Other people may say, well, that means we can't trust anesthesiology. I'll leave that up to them to argue. But I do want to mention one thing, which is that if you look at the demographics of this list, and we, we go down to 30. I just took a screenshot of the top 10. Um, all of these are men, actually. And if you go down to the top 30, only, there's only one woman currently on that list, and she's way at the bottom. I think she's actually the last person on that list. So, and it turns out that if, even if you control for, uh, and Farrakh and Arturo did this in a paper, if you control for the uh, number of men in science, the number of men publishing and all in senior positions and all of that, you still end up with a nine to one uh, relationship. And those are nine, men are nine times more likely to have papers retracted for fraud. So, yay men, we're either better at committing fraud or we're better at getting caught at it. I'm not sure which one I'd prefer. But just to give you a flavor of some of what we're seeing here. Um, so on the next slide, and just to sort of reinforce this idea that a lot of what we're seeing is simply better screening, better ability to catch these errors. Um, this is another paper that Farrakh and Arturo did in uh, 2011. And what they did was they, they, they plotted impact factor, and that will probably be a su subject to some discussion today, I'm sure, at your meeting. Um, and retraction index was just the rate of retraction, so number of retractions per thousand papers published. And what they found was that they're pretty tightly correlated. Not 100%, it's, but you know, the regression analysis is pretty clean here. The Lancet's off in its own little place there. It's not exactly where you'd expect it based on the other relationships. But the New England Journal of Medicine, with the highest impact factor in the world of any original research journal, also has the highest rate of retractions. And again, you would expect that given that more people are reading these journals. Um, other people say, well, it's also true that people are pushing the envelope to get into these journals, that's true. Uh, but the point is, clearly there's a screening effect here, and it, it, this is just a data point. It needs to be uh, studied better and interpreted, but it's something interesting to look at. Um, uh, something that's a little more serious that I, I think also plays into peer review because, um, you know, unless I'm totally mistaken, and, and all the people I've ever spoken to are totally mistaken, uh, peer reviewers don't typically look at um, look at citation lists, they don't look at reference lists. And what happens, and this is this slide and actually the next slide, uh, both work by John Budd and his colleagues. Um, this is actually a replication of, of the same analysis, just of two different data sets, one 12 years after the other. Uh, what they found in the punchline here is that more than 90% of the time when a retracted paper is cited, it's cited as if it would never been retracted. Now if you tried to show up to a courtroom at least here in the U.S., where I know the court system a little bit, with a precedent, and you said, "Your Honor, you know, members of the jury, uh, you should, you know, declare my uh, my client innocent, or, or excuse me, not guilty, or guilty, or whatever, or you know, what have you." The prosecution says guilty because of this precedent in a court, you know, in another court. If that precedent had been overturned by a higher court you would lose that case, and you might even be disbarred if the judge thought that you knew that it had been uh, overturned after, after the case you were bringing to them, or after the precedent you bring to them. That's not true in science. Actually, people just go on. And so more than 90% of the time, they continue to cite things that they've never been retracted. Um, and on the next slide, I'll show you just again, we have another leaderboard for the most highly cited retracted papers. Uh, very hard to read even for me from here, but we have, ten, we have a top 10 list here. The top one on the list is a paper from Science from 2005. It was retracted in 2007. That's been retracted, excuse me, that's been cited about 1,000 times. Most of their citations actually came after the paper was retracted. Now, when you look at the citations of this paper, it turns out a lot of them are to say it was retracted. Uh, or they say it was retracted, but much of the paper still stands, which actually everyone agrees with. This wasn't fraud or anything like that. So that's sort of, that's, that's fine. That, that makes sense. Number two on the list, though, is Andrew Wakefield and the paper that claimed that there was a link, of course, between autism and vaccines, uh, which created lots of issues, uh, you know, as we all know. But again, cited about a thousand times, but most of those citations came, but I think it's yeah, two thirds, three quarters of those citations, almost three quarters of those citations came before the paper was retracted, because it took 12 years to get retracted. And most of the citations afterward say that it was retracted. 
However, there were a lot of there were a lot of papers on this list for, which were cited as if they continued to be in the literature instead of retracted, and that's a problem. But just to show you the data there, and one of the reasons why this happens on the next slide, I show uh, a paper from Grant Steen that he did several years ago, and I'll just flip to the next slide in the interest of time to show you sort of the punchline here. A third of the time, almost a third of the time, there's no way to tell that a paper is been retracted. So you look at it on PubMed, you look at it on on the publisher's site, you look at the PDF, and it just exists. It doesn't say it was retracted. So you can understand why people would not necessarily know it was retracted and therefore might cite it. Now, you know, they should be following literature and all that, but we all know that's a difficult thing to do, uh, to keep up with. And so again, one of the reasons we have funding actually at Retraction Watch and the Center for Scientific Integrity is to create a database of retractions. Uh, so that any time you go to cite a paper or to look you have in your library of papers something that's happened and it'll let you know when the paper's been retracted. So that you can decide what to do about it. You might decide to do something with your paper, correct it, you might decide you don't need to. That's your choice. But at least you'll know that it was retracted and that's that's what we're creating as a database. Um, one of the things we see, and I, I think this is relevant to peer review only in the sense that, or at least in the sense that you should know, again, what has happened in a paper so you can decide whether to cite it or not, whether to carry forward with the research is, this is a typical retraction notice in the Journal of Neuroscience. It's also a typical retraction notice from a number of other journals, but I just have the Journal of Neuroscience here. I would challenge you to tell me why this paper is retracted and therefore what we should know about it and what we should think about it. Um, and there are various reasons why the journals will give for this kind of notice that doesn't really add any value, um, but it's you know, we don't think that that's particularly helpful for the literature. And so you might say, well, why do you have that? On the next slide, um, I'll show you. And this is one reason why Nature, which in, in what we think, this is a, an editorial from a couple years ago, and what we think was a pretty honest and forthright way of talking about this problem, said, you know, lawyers. Now, I like lawyers. Maybe there's some lawyers in the audience um, who are related to a lot of lawyers. Um, it's not really the lawyers, to me, that are causing the problem. It's their clients who insist on hiring lawyers. So we see more and more attorneys getting involved with the retraction process, with the scientific misconduct process. Uh, sometimes they treat it as employment law uh, and sort of employment issues. But there are lots of reasons why we see this. And often what happens, and what Nature talked about happening here, is that that really muddies the waters. It's difficult to tell. Uh, you know, they, they end up having a retraction as it doesn't tell you the whole story or that it takes a really long time. Both of those things are bad. And this is something that we're certainly keeping an eye on. We talk to lawyers all the time. Um, however, one journal has decided, you know, you're right. We're not going to do this anymore. The Journal of Biological Chemistry. And uh, this is, I'm sorry, on the next slide, just for those of you uh, flipping the slides. Um, the Journal of Biological Chemistry says, you know, and, and I bolted the bottom there, but, you know, we're tired of listening to you guys and retraction watch and everyone else. We're going to just actually include information in our retraction notices and tell you what happened and there that's what you get there um, and they've true their word they've been true to their word they actually do include a lot of information in their notices which we think is a good thing um, let me just shift gears in the last a few minutes here and, and talk about uh, you know a little bit more directly in terms of peer review what's happening and and that is that we see a tremendous growth and we think this is a good thing in post-publication peer review now post-publication peer review is nothing new I think we all know what it is uh, anyone who's been to a journal club, you sit around, you riff apart a paper, you talk about what the problems are, <coughs> excuse me, and you then, you know, but then that's it. You know, you finish your coffee, you finish your donuts, you leave the room. But now, a lot of those post-publication peer reviews are, they exist online. So you can take all those comments you just said and, and argued with each other that were about in, in journal club, and you can bring them to PubPeer. So many of you may know PubPeer.com. Uh, it's also involved in a little bit of litigation. Um, some, someone's trying to sue their comment, some of their commenters, which is another story. I, I won't take the time today, but uh, of course happy to talk about it uh, if that's uh, of interest in, in the questions, questions and answers, which I welcome. Um, but this is a, to us, this is a really welcome development. It means that all of that effort can actually live somewhere. The, the corresponding authors actually should get a notice. That's what's supposed to happen with Pub Peer. And so we've actually seen this lead to a lot of corrections and refractions. Um, not so much the case with uh, PubMed Commons, which again, you can leave comments on any paper that's been indexed there, but you have to use your real name, which tends to you know, change the way people 
you know, interact with each other, which is good and bad in many ways. But there have been some cases that might have been due to those two comments on PubMed comments, although it's difficult to tell. But in any case, Pub, Pub here, we urge you to definitely check it out. We've seen a lot of corrections and retractions from that, as I mentioned. One other way, and I'll just close with this. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm on the next slide now. Just to tell you about Yuri Simonson, who has done a lot of work with uh, psychology and, and one particular kind of post-publication re peer review. I'm actually going to describe it in the other story on the next slide with Yoshi Takafuji, but just to mention that Simonson had, you know, really investigated a lot of psychology researchers and ended up, there were a lot of retractions that resulted. Uh, people actually, some of them lost their positions. Um, what he did was very similar to what happened in the Yoshi Takafuji case, which I told you I would tell you about. But very briefly, uh, Fuji, and this is a piece that Adam and I did for Nautilus uh, magazine about a year and a half ago now, um, and it described what, what was really a statistical analysis that someone did of Yoshitaka Fuji's work after sort of seeing some red flags in it. And they wanted to see whether or not the results had the variability, had the variation that you would expect if they were real. So in terms of nature, you would expect to see some sort of distribution, You'd see some outliers, you'd see, you know, some, the data would look a certain way. Uh, in this case, they just didn't look that way. So that even when we lie, uh, even when we make up data and think, oh, I'm putting this little extra, you know, outlier here and something that will make people think, well, if you, if you fake the data, you would make it perfect. Well, actually, we're not as good as that as we think. So when, his name was John Carlyle, when he ran the analysis of Fuji's work, he found that the likelihood that it was due to uh, you know, sort of real, that, that it existed, uh, it had the variation you would expect was 1 times 10 to the minus 33rd. So basically zero. And, you know, sometime later, now we've seen many, many refractions. He's now at the top of the leaderboard, as I mentioned. And we've, we've seen this in other cases, too. There's actually a lot of interesting things happening in this space where people are starting to look at this as a different way to tell whether data are, again, quote, unquote, real or not, as a form of post-publication peer review. So I want to leave you with that. Um, on the very last slide, my next slide, uh, is uh, just some acknowledgments. Um, that's how to reach me and uh, our generous funders and some people who have you know, helped me over the, over the years in terms of uh, Nancy, for example, with slides. I also want to help, uh, I want to thank uh, Greg Laub, who is my colleague here at MedPage today, who's uh, graciously um, doing the videotaping for me and going to do some editing to make me hopefully sound better than I, uh, than I do. But I look forward to your questions. And uh, thanks very much for the opportunity, and sorry I couldn't be there. Okay, so again, um, please say your name and, and where you're from when you're asking a question, and please do wait for a mic so that Ivan can hear you from the other side of the Atlantic. <laughs> Who wants to start? Hello, David Cahoon, UCL. Are, are there actual cases of authors suing journals because a, a paper was rejected? I mean, that's a most appalling behavior. Ah, you can't hear. I, I think I heard, let me just repeat back, and I think I, maybe I heard enough of it. Uh, hi, David. Um, I think you were asking whether there are actual cases of authors suing journals, is that correct? Yes. Sure. Um, there have been. Uh, I mean, one thing to, to note is that we don't, of course, always hear about some of these uh, threat, uh, threats, certainly, or even lawsuits, uh, if they're settled or if they're sealed or what have you. But there have been some cases, um, a, a particular one that happened, uh, I want to say, about a year ago, call it a year, a year and a half ago, um, a researcher in Brazil uh, actually sued uh, the journal, uh, sued the publisher of the journal Diabetes because they had published four expressions of concern. Uh, he wanted to get an injunction against those. Um, now, I will say that uh, he, he chose, or he actually had to sue in the U.S. because that's where the American Diabetes Association obviously is, is headquartered. Um, that's a unfortunate for him sort, uh, sort of uh, venue choice because uh, the U.S., and, and I would not, I would be the, the last to say that the U.S. is ahead of the world in many ways, um, but in terms of libel law, libel and defamation, uh, it actually is fairly well advanced. It has some of the, the better laws. And so he lost that case. He actually lost an appeal as well. 
Um, there have been some other cases. We've reported on some, of course, under Traction Watch. There was one involving a Golden Rice trial. Um, she didn't win either. Uh, again, I could sort of, you know, sort of happy to hunt through and find some other examples. But uh, it, is a, it is a real thing. How common it actually is, of course, is, is unclear. But the threat of it is probably more of the uh, active issue, I would say, than, than, you know, how many cases there actually are. Mm. So if, uh, is that going to be a problem if, as I advocate, we give up journals and just publish on the web? <laughs> Who gets sued then, the individual author? Uh, could be. I, as they say on the internet, I'm I'm not a lawyer, so I uh, and of course, jurisdic um, different uh, cases would fall into di different jurisdictions. Um, uh, I, 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 if I can speculate a little bit, I, I would say that uh, people who want to uh, threaten others into uh, shutting up would find someone some way to to do that. Uh, whether it would involve a lawsuit or something similar, I, of course, I can't say. I have a question from Carvey. Um, hi, Evan. Uh, my name is Jock Strap. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Sorry, my name is Carvey Bazagan from River Valley Technologies. Um, uh, it's uh, the, the fact that we're getting so many, so much uh, bad behavior and retractions. Is this not? Would you agree it's the, the pressure the, the, the pressure to publish and really this very old-fashioned system we have, as David was saying, the, of the paper and the journal? And perhaps we should really say goodbye to the paper and the journal and have some kind of micro-publication on the web where everyone is seeing the results right from the start so you don't have even time to fabricate this, this sort of 10-page uh, uh, publication. Yeah, I think you know. I, I'm not. I'm not going to say that I have a a, a sort of an ideal solution in, in mind. Um, but I think that the spirit of what you're saying, uh, we very much agree with. And and to that end, we would say that what we have to do is stop sort of fetishizing the the published paper, the scientific paper. And let's face it, we have to stop fetishizing the published paper in one of the top journals. That's a lot of uh, some of the problem is that we you know, sort of say, you have to do this in order to get tenure and, you know, and grants and all of that. Um, and so if we find a way to uh, limit the amount that that works in terms of incentives, I think we'd be better off. And obviously we're seeing a uh, move toward preprints in some disciplines. Some disciplines have been using preprints for quite a while. Um, so there is some sense that what we want really is for the scientific record to reflect uh, our state of knowledge, our, our sort of state of progress or lack of progress, um, instead of sort of these punctuated moments that are really sort of false narratives. I mean, if you look at the, you know, there are actually a lot of parallels. I and mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a journalist, really, by, by profession and all that. And, and I see a lot of parallels in, in terms of the, the problems that we see in journalism, where you have to have this sort of perfect narrative that, that fits, and, and you sort of leave out the details that don't really help that narrative, and that is sort of what we're seeing, whereas if we just sort of published everything, now, of course, the question for scientific publishing as well as for uh, journalism is how to sort of make that financially sustainable. Um, I hate to use the word business model, but in, in fact, we do need to think about how this would all work uh, and, and sustain itself. Um, but I, I think you're right that in, in, in the general sense that we need to come up with something better. Hi, um, Alicia Newton, Nature Geoscience. And the number of retractions you're showing shows there's this massive amount of fraudulent work making it into the literature and journals that we generally think of as having a pretty strong peer review. And is there anything we can be doing at that pre-publication stage to try and root this out more so that we're not seeing these retraction leaderboards, but just not seeing it entering the reputable literature? Um, sure. I mean, it's a it's a great question, and and I think that um, one of the themes that you see a lot is sort of image manipulation. I mean, if you look at the if, well, let me take a step back. If you look at the actual um, percentages of reason for retraction, about twenty five percent of retractions 
in this 2012 paper that, that Farrick and Grant and Arturo did, uh, about 25 percent were due to something that uh, should have been, or at least could have been, caught by plagiarism detection software, which I know that you know at this point most publishers are using. Um, and you know, if we sort of hope in the future that we will have something that looks like that for image manipulation, uh, something you know, Mike Rossner and other people are looking at, at doing things like that. Um, that could also, of course, prevent something. But the the flip side of that is that um, fraudsters uh, and and you know. I don't, you know, it's not necessarily criminal behavior, but sort of criminals in the in the lowercase c sense. Um, they're always a few steps ahead of us. Uh, you're always fighting last year's battle. So I think that um, while it would be great to think about, you know, preventing all of this, and I think there are ways to prevent it. By the way, a lot of editors who, on the one hand, will say, you know, to journalists, don't please don't write about anything that isn't peer reviewed. Because that means you know people have seen it and we've checked it out. On the other hand, when a retraction happens, we'll say, "Oh well, there's no way that that peer review could have caught that." I, I always you know I'm I'm not that clever a person apparently because I don't really see how those things can both be true, um, in in a large sense. But I think that you know it's really more about understanding that a published paper isn't sacrosanct. And getting back to what I was saying earlier, and accepting that there will be some fraud, there will be some mistakes. Um, and accepting that that happens and, and being, being open about it. I think that's one of the, the great things about science. And, and the thing, one of the things that science should be really proud of is that it has a self-correcting mechanism. Um, let's face it, it's still a vanishingly small percentage of papers that are attracted. We're talking about you know, 0.02%, 0.03%, depending on sort of which denominator you use. Um, clearly, more papers than that should be retracted. Uh, but I, I don't think it's not you know, half of papers that should be retracted. It's, it's some percentage larger than 0.02 percent, but it's not going to be so massive that, um, you know, it, that fraud is just everywhere. I think it's, 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 again, it's more common than we sort of can see, but it's, it's still a relatively rare event. In the interests of um, time, I think we'll take two more questions. We've got a lady there and then one more from David and then we'll run for lunch. So apologies to anybody we haven't been able to fit in. Hello. Oh. Thank you for calling me a lady. Um, Jojo Scoble, I um, have no affiliation, um, but I was interested to hear what you were saying about how we um, get the retraction um, seen by those who, are, who have already used the references, because my worry is that once I've used the paper and the information in that paper and cited it, I don't realize that there's a correction even or that it's been retracted because of my ignorance because I've been, you know, working too hard or something, you know. It, it was so reliant on the community to tell us these things. Um, how do you see the future of that working its way into uh, the academic's life? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, one question is, you know, whether you should do anything about that if you find out. And, and I think that that's something best left to the individual, you know, the authors of that, of that paper. Uh, sometimes finding out that you've retracted, that you've cited a, a now retracted paper uh, in the past, you know, sometimes that makes a big difference. Sometimes it may not make a huge difference. And that's really up to you. And I think that should be the way it is. Um, that being said, there, I think you do need to know that. Um, it's one of the goals of the project we're still working on uh, in terms of our database. We had a first, you know, two-year grant from the MacArthur Foundation and, and from uh, the Arnold Foundation to also work on this, um, and it's you know it's an ongoing process. Um, you know our grant officer, our program officer at MacArthur, you know, is very clear. This is a the beginning. Um, this is going to take a, a while to to sort of be comprehensive. Uh, we're working on it. One of the things um, I think Matt Hodgkinson is in the audience. At least I think he is by the, the tweets or he's at least following along. Um, you can look at the way that uh, they're using, and this maybe gets back to the last question too, uh, the way that they're using um, Retraction Watch as a sort of informal database, because we have so many, you know, refractions we've covered, to actually screen, uh, you know, authors. We, we did a Q&A with him on the site like that. Um, but so moving forward, we hope that our database, there's another project that um, I, I think is supposed to be launching soon that um, it, it's somebody else's project. I don't want to say too much about it, but um, I, I think you'll be, uh, you, you'll find that it's, um, you know, going to be very much in line with this, and we're very excited about it, and we're thrilled to be able to help out in, in, in some way with it. Using our uh, using you know our material, 
Um, so I think that we're going to get to a point where if we can pipe in, whether it's our database, whether it's someone else's, uh, you can pipe that into our, uh, you know, into, you know, whatever uh, software you're using, whatever personal library software you're using, so that it can ping you sort of both forward and backward. Um, that, that would sort of hopefully solve a lot of the problem. Um, whether it would, whether people would pay attention is of course another question, but I think that it does get, a, get us sort of past the problem of relying completely on existing technology and existing, you know, whether publishers or PubMed or, or what have you to uh, do that. I think they're a really important part of the ecosystem and hopefully our database can feed there too. Although you say the, uh, David Cahoon again, although you say that the, uh, the proportion of, fraction, of retractions for fraud is low, the proportion of papers that are wrong, according to John Ioannidis at least, is rather high, probably more than 50% in the biomedical uh, regime. And that, and that is really quite appalling, I think. Uh, I, I have a hobby now of asking people to define a p-value, probably 10% get it accurate, and about 1% of them realize that it's not asking the right question anyway. Um, th there's a, there is a real problem, and that's what annoys me is that it's a problem imposed by older scientists against younger ones. I mean, my, my standard talk <laughs> includes the words, don't respect your elders but not betters, because we've set a very bad example by putting this insane pressure on people. Um, so, yeah, if there's a question there, it's, it's what are we going to do about the 50% of papers that are wrong, never mind the 0.1% that are fraudulent? Yeah, I mean, we, we get this question a fair amount, and I, I think that uh, to be a little bit, uh, I'll be a little bit sort of, um, uh, you know, intentionally falsely black and white about this for a second, David, just as a construct. Um, you know, what, uh, what COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics Guidelines, say is, is I think, as, as probably everyone in the room knows, you know, if there's fraud involved, that, that it doesn't matter whether the results sort of held up later. That should be retracted. Uh, plagiarism, of course. Uh, and then honest error that changes the conclusions dramatically. And, and I think that some people would say that, you know, a lot of the papers that uh, John Inides and, and others, you know, who are doing the kind of work he's doing, the sort of meta-analysis of, of studies and what have you, uh, you know, those would fall into the category of, of, you know, honest error perhaps, but that really dramatically changed the conclusion. Um, I, I think that what this points out is not so much, you know, should they all be retracted? I mean, it's a fair question. Um, I leave it to the scientific community and to, to others to sort of say that. We actually, and, and sometimes I think people don't quite know what to make of this, but we often say that retraction is probably not the best, uh, retraction is probably not the best mechanism to cleanse the literature in, in a lot of cases. It should be the nuclear option. Um, you know, John Maddox famously said in, in response to a reporter a number of years ago, um, you know, how, he, the reporter said, how much of what you publish every week is wrong? And Maddox said, you know, all of it. Uh, and, and what he meant, of course, was that over time things are, you know, understood differently. We have a, we gain new knowledge. We learn the things we thought were true or not true. And so what we need is a system, not so much that relies on this sort of nuclear option and black and white of retraction, although those are very important for some cases, uh, is a system where when you get to a particular paper, you see it in the stream, and this gets back to what I was sort of saying earlier in, in response to a different question, and you should have it marked, and it should, you know, crossmark is a good technology for that that some publishers use uh, in, a, in a somewhat limited way. Um, you should be able to see what has happened since, maybe a good distillation of that, um, a sort of almost wiki, I mean, although not necessarily depending on ind individuals to, to curate. Um, and so if you have a paper and you're looking at it, you should know that there were some letters written about it. There were some citations that were maybe negative. You need the sentiment of citations, not just the fact that something was cited, because that doesn't tell you anything, really. Um, so I think that's, in the long term, a much better solution than sort of trying to rid the literature of all of these papers. Um, again, uh, you know, Retraction Watch, we're sort of busy enough and can't even keep up with all the retractions. We certainly wouldn't want to try and keep up with half of the papers in the world being retracted every year. That would would be quite something else. We'd have to call ourselves something else. Um, but I, I, I think that I think that it's a it's a long term solution in terms of what our post publication, what the post publication life of a paper should look like, uh, and the pre publication, you know, life of a paper should look like, rather than uh, do we retract all of them. 
Thank you very much on behalf of the room in London. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.